Well, most of you, if you've been around this church for any time, know that I enjoy sports. Um, I played them when I was able, and I enjoy watching them, sports of all kinds. And all that started when I fell in love with baseball when I was a little boy growing up in Akron, Ohio. So naturally, the first ball team that I ended up being a fan of was the Cleveland Indians. Any Indians fans here? Anybody grow up an Indian fan? It's kind of a lonely place to be, a Cleveland Indian fan. Uh, one of my first heroes, in fact, was a player named Rocky Calavito, who was the star of the Indians back in the early 60s, late 50s. And I still have a baseball signed by Rocky in my East Campus office uh, today. But when I was in the fourth grade, uh, my family moved from Akron, Ohio, to a small town about 40 miles north of New York City. So when we got to New York, I quickly discovered that all of my new friends, all of them, were rabid Yankee fans. I mean, the Yankees. From the Cleveland Indians to the Yankees. I hated the Yankees. It took most of the first year, but eventually I became a diehard Yankee fan as well. The Yankees were pretty awful in those years, if you're a baseball fan, between 1965 and 1974 when we lived there. But it didn't matter to us, we loved the Yankees. But in the summer of 1969, all that changed. Because the other team in New York, the New York Mets, went from being the worst team in baseball to winning the World Series. Now, if you're a longtime Cubs fan, I hate to bring up 1969 because it brings up bad memories for you. I'm just sorry about that. But as the Mets went from, uh, from the worst to the best on their improbable run, they were called the Amazing Mets or the Miracle Mets. And I can still remember seeing signs popping up all over our region that said, Believe in Miracles. This was at a ball game back in 1969. Believe in Miracles. Now, I stayed a Yankee fan, but with all the excitement, it was hard not to become kind of a closet Mets fan. And that summer, I became a believer in the Miracle Mets. Well, a couple years later, 1973, they won again. This time, the slogan was simply, you gotta believe. Signs were all over in the ballpark, on billboards, in yards. The slogan repeated with almost religious fervor, you gotta believe. And that was just about baseball. We're starting today a summer series uh, that's going to last us till we start uh, our next preaching series on August 23rd, 10 weeks called What's in a Word? We're going to study 10 transformational verbs in the New Testament, and along the way, we're going to memorize one verse each week. Now, I know some of you probably have done some memorization of Bible verses in your life. Some of you may have never done that. It may be a little bit intimidating, but we're going to do one verse at a time. We'll go through it several times tonight. We'll put it out there on social media and so forth on the website. We want you to memorize one verse each week all summer. That's 10 verses because there's one word in each verse that is absolutely transformational, a key verse in our faith, and that's what we're going to do for the next 10 weeks. Let's get started. Today's transformational verb is believe. Believe. One of the clearest places this word is talked about in the New Testament is Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. The, the Apostle Paul is writing. He writes, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. That's the whole passage. The single verse we're going to memorize is Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, everybody look at the screens. You're going to say it with me now. We're going to do it twice. All right? Concentrate. Try to get it into your cerebral cortex, whatever part of your brain memorizes. Join me. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One more time. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, what does it mean to believe? Most of us assume we know what that word means. We use it all the time. Believe in miracles. I believe. you got to believe. Just believe. Now, the Greek word for believe is pistu pistuo, and it's used as a verb, and it comes from the same root as the noun for faith, the very same noun. It means to be convinced of truth, to have confidence in, to trust in, and to rely upon. Now, I'm going to talk about three aspects of believing today. First, believing with your mind. Believing with your mind. During my senior year in college, I had to take a physics class. And I had to take it my senior year because I put it off all the years leading up to my senior year to finish my science requirement because I wasn't a science guy. I wasn't a math guy. 
but I wasn't by myself. Several of my buddies had done the exact same thing, so we're all in this class together as seniors of college. It was a class designed for non-science majors called Project Physics. We called it Bonehead Physics, which was closer to the point. A couple of weeks into the class, the professor is trying to explain to us why the sky is dark at night. Now, that seemed to all of us, we were sitting in the back of the class, like a particularly stupid thing to try to convince us, to teach us about. Why is the sky dark at night? We're like, well, the sun goes down. Duh. You know? But he's trying to explain that with billions upon billions of stars in the universe, everywhere we look at night, there should be a point of light, like you see on the screens. It should be filled with points of light because there's billions of stars out there. Then he said the sky is dark at night because of something called the red shift. Now, if you're a science guy out there, you, you'll be able to explain this better than me. I'm not, I'm not even sure I have it right to this day. He said the universe is expanding and the stars are moving away from us and each other at, at speeds so great that the light they emit is shifted out of the visible spectrum and we can't see it. That's why the sky is dark at night. And at that point, my roommate, Mike, sitting right next to me, closed his notebook with emphasis and said under his breath, I don't have to believe that. He said, and he said it in such a manner it made me laugh out loud in class. I almost got in trouble for it. And I still remember to this day what he said every time I look at the sky at night. I don't have to believe that, he said. Even in the face of scientific and mathematical evidence, he refused to believe with his mind. Now, that reminds me that there is an objective content to what we believe. People are capable of believing all kinds of things, aren't they? Here are just a few harmless wives tales, wives tales that people do believe. The Great Wall of China can be seen from the moon. I've heard people say that. It can't. They can't even see it from orbit, let alone the moon. Lightning never strikes twice, twice in the same place. That's actually quite a common occurrence. Lightning likes to strike in the same place multiple times. Elvis is still alive. People are, did it touch the nerve out there? People believe in all kinds of conspiracy theories. Some people believe the moon landing by Neil Armstrong was faked in Hollywood. I was in a fitness center the other day and overheard an actual conversation. Actual conversation. One guy's telling another guy that the assassination of JFK was a government plot led by Gerald Ford that involved eight snipers and the fatal shot came from a sewer drain. The other guy goes, wow, I didn't know that. The guy saying it goes, well, yeah, I saw it on a video on YouTube. Took all I could do not to step into that one, okay? Sometimes believing the wrong thing can be quite deadly, quite serious. Some will remember back in 1997, a cult group called the Heaven's Gate Cult, led by a guy named Marshall Applewhite. You might remember this haunting face. He convinced 39 men and women that a spaceship was coming behind a comet to take them and rescue them off the earth, and they all committed mass suicide. Now, according to the Bible, to believe is to be convinced or persuaded that something is true. That is, there is an objective content to what we believe. Here's what the verse says. Join me again. See if you can do it without looking at the screen. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's objective content there. Paul says, believe in your heart. We'll talk about the heart in just a minute. But I think we can make an assumption there's a relationship between heart and mind. And we see that connection in the first part of the verse. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. There is objective content there. We are to believe with our minds that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because God raised him from the dead. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. See, for a Christian, believing means to believe God raised Jesus from the dead as objective truth. It means to believe that the resurrection of Jesus isn't some religious fairy tale. It's not a myth created by his grieving disciples. It's not a hoax pulled over 2 billion people worldwide over 2,000 years. It's a historical event that's verifiable every bit as the lunar landing and Washington crossing in Delaware is historically verifiable. It means we believe Jesus really lived as the incarnate Son of God. It means we believe Jesus really died as the final and perfect sacrifice for all human sin. It means Jesus really rose again to forever defeat the powers of sin and death. It means Jesus lives today and has given us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us and in his church forever. 
To believe is to love God with your mind. Did you know that God wants you to use your mind? Let me speak just for a moment to students or you scientific types out there. You don't have to put your brain in a box to be a Christian. Some people believe that, that you just have to quit thinking and believe with your heart. Just got to believe. No. God is the most intelligent being in the universe, if indeed he is God. And God created you in his own image. That is, he created you with the brain, with intelligence, with the curiosity to ask questions, with a desire to know how everything works, with a capacity for logic, and he wants you to use your mind. Science and faith are not enemies. God invented science. Listen to Psalm 8. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? God wants us to consider, to think about, to investigate, to dig into the mysteries of the universe because as we do that, we find the greatness of his love for each one of us. I read a great article online this past week by a guy who said there are four ways we can love God with our minds every day. First, he said, through reason or logic. All throughout the book of Acts, we saw Paul relentlessly reasoning with crowds gathered to argue with him about faith. He reasoned. He reasoned. The, all his letters are reasoning with people, demonstrating the validity of faith. C.S. Lewis, in fact, became a follower of Christ through the use of his own great intellect, through using logic. Read his story sometime. Secondly, through knowledge. Proverbs says, The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. We love God by filling our minds with the truths of his word. Through knowledge. Through memory, he said. Memory. Throughout the Bible, we're told to remember over and over again, to remember God's goodness, remember God's faithfulness, remember God's deliverance, because remembrance leads to gratitude. And gratitude to praise. And finally, fourthly, he said, we love God through our imaginations. I was thinking about that in the first few worship songs tonight. The God who wraps himself in light. I can't even begin to say those words without employing my imagination. What does that mean? We begin to imagine things greater than ourselves, things we've never seen, and that leads us into worship. Our imagination is a tool for worshiping the God who gave us that imagination. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Love God with your mind. We are to believe with our minds. The second aspect of believing I think we see in this key verse is believing with our hearts. Believing with our minds and then believing with our hearts. Lorraine and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary uh, in April, this past April. And we celebrated in the way that God intended by watching one of our sons play college baseball. We also went to a bed and breakfast a couple days after that, so there was a romantic part of our getaway as well. We celebrated 30 years. Um, that 30 years ago, we made a set of really, when you think about it, quite insane promises to each other. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Promises that absolutely depend on the same transformational verb, to believe. Question, how do you believe someone when they promise to love only you for the rest of their lives till death do us part? How do you ever muster the belief to believe that? Well, that's more than believing with your mind. That's more than understanding what the words mean. It's more than believing marriage is a good thing. It's believing with the heart. Paul says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now the word believe means more than just acknowledging with our minds something might be true. It means also to trust that which we believed to be true. To believe is to be convinced, so convinced that, that something is true, that we're willing to trust our life to that truth. Let me give you an example. Suppose you're walking along a path and you come to a bridge that spans a deep canyon. Okay? Last summer, I walked across this bridge. 
This is in Ecuador. I was with the Trek High School mission team. They're heading there again to maybe be there right now. This is a photo of a suspension bridge we had to cross over a waterfall that was about 100 feet beneath us. Now, you might look at that bridge, as I did before stepping onto it, and believe with your mind that it could hold you. If you were with someone smart enough who had studied engineering, they could investigate and show you the mathematical and engineering formulas that could prove it was safe to hold your body weight. You could do all that. You might even see other people walking across that bridge so you know it would hold you, but so far up to the point where you actually step onto that bridge, all your belief is intellectual. It's only theoretical. It's in your head. When do you really believe that bridge will hold you? When you put all your weight on it. And I can still remember the moment I stepped on that bridge because it moved when you stepped on that bridge. It was a suspension bridge. Every person that stepped on it, you could feel it. We all walked across that bridge. That's trust. That's believing with your heart. And that's what it means to trust Jesus. See, I think there are a whole lot of people who believe in Jesus the way I believe in Vladimir Putin. The way I believe that he's president of Russia. I believe he exists. I think he's a real guy. I think he's a historical figure. He's got a lot of power in Russia. I've seen pictures of the guy, but I'm not moving there, right? I'm not going there to follow him. I think many people believe someone called Jesus of Nazareth really lived. He was a really good guy, taught some amazing things, but that doesn't mean they've trusted him with their hearts, with their lives. You may be here tonight. You may have always believed that Jesus existed. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about trusting him with your heart, with your life. Hindus believe Jesus existed, and they have 330 million other gods that they worship. Muslims believe Jesus existed, that he was a prophet, and just that Muhammad was greater. The Bible says Satan himself believes in Jesus. Satan knows who Jesus is and what Jesus did, but Satan does not trust Jesus. See, you can believe Jesus existed without ever acknowledging your own sinfulness. You can believe Jesus existed without ever accepting his authority and his sacrifice. You can believe Jesus existed without repentance and surrender. You can. And just that's not what Paul's talking about. It's not just believing he lived, died, and rose again. It's believing he did all those things for you. It's trusting that Jesus knew you and loved you before you were born. It's knowing that he knew you. It's believing that he loved you and forgave you when you didn't deserve either one. It's trusting that he's the only way to the forgiveness of sin. He's the only way to peace, hope, and joy. He's the only bridge to what we call salvation, heaven, and eternal life. Now, here's the question. Do you believe in Jesus the same way I believe in Vladimir Putin? Or do you believe in Jesus in the way I believed my wife when she said, I'll be faithful to you 30 years ago, when I trusted my whole life to what she said? There's a difference. Believing with your mind, believing with your heart, and thirdly, believing with your life. Believing with your life. I read this story a few years ago, and it's probably an internet legend, but it makes a point. A person could be a man, could be a woman. I'll let you choose which one you think it was when I get to the end of the story, okay? It's up to you. Uh, A person is driving a car through rush hour traffic. Someone cuts them off uh, without asking to cut in or waving their hand to say thank you. You know, I hate that, don't you? You're in, you're in, you're in, you just at least wave your hand or something. Let me know you acknowledge that. I, let, I hate it when they don't do that, right? So the person gets steamed. So he or she uh, starts honking and gesturing to the person who cut him or her off. Just, they're just frosted, irritated. Start gesturing, oh, you should have waved, you should have waved, you're in front of me, starts honking. And then he or she actually starts to pursue the other driver in rush hour traffic, looking for a way to cut them off and return the favor. Just, just you know, kind of out of control road rage. Then all of a sudden, flashing lights in the rear mirror. A highway patrolman pulls him or her over. After the routine check of license and insurance, the officer says, okay, looks like everything's fine, you're free to go. The driver says, why did you pull me over then? And the officer says, well, I saw the fish symbol on the back of your car and I just assumed the car was stolen. You gotta think about that a little bit. And then tell me if you think it was a man or a woman driving the car, right? Here's something I hesitate to admit, maybe I shouldn't, 
but I think some of you might do the same thing. Sometimes I find myself kind of profiling people. Do you ever do that? Like I'm sitting in an airport. Recently I traveled a couple times. Sitting in an airport, you know, you're, it's not enough time to really do anything. And so I'm just watching people go by. And I find myself starting to try to guess people's life stories in just a few seconds. Anybody ever do that? It's, a, it's kind of dangerous. Maybe it's not very kind, but I do it. And I ask myself, okay, what, just about how they dress, how they walk, expression on their faces. T- just, I try to t- quickly, in two seconds, tell their life story in my head. Um, one of the things I try to guess is whether or not they're Christians. And then it strikes me, I wonder if somebody's doing that to me right now. And then you can go round and round about that. Listen to what James says, James chapter 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith to believe and has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or in daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, believing by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. So to believe means to be convinced something is true and to be convinced enough to trust your life to that truth. But what does believing look like from the outside? James is telling us that believing looks like action. Just as our faith has an objective content that's true, our faith must have an outcome that's visible. That's what James is teaching us. Now, I want to be very careful here. James is not teaching. The Bible does not teach that we are saved by what we do. We do not earn our salvation by piling up enough good deeds to outweigh the bad deeds. That's another religion. And there are plenty of them that teach that. That's not Christianity. The gospel says we're saved by faith in Jesus Period. But James is saying that when we believe in, trust Jesus with our minds and our hearts, the natural result of that, the inevitable result of that, is a changed life and changed behavior. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. See the connection? Love God. Love others. Not just love God, be loved by God. He could have stopped right there, but he didn't. He never did. And neighbor as yourself. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That's where it starts. Grace is first. Through faith. Believing. And this not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for for us to do. See it again, the connection? Grace is first. Good deeds are the result. Action is the result. That's why week after week we say we exist to reach, connect, equip, and serve. If we just said reach, connect, equip, that would be good, but we'd be missing something terribly important. We'd be missing the outward dimension of what it means to believe. We'd be missing impact. Without serving, we've just been reached, we've been connected, we've been equipped, and we'd just be pew potatoes. Right? We'd just be sitting here. We would never be put into action. We'd be the nice car that somebody, some people have, the, the antique car that sits in the garage with a blanket over it. It never goes anywhere, but it looks really nice. Serving is what makes believing real and tangible. Serving is our currency in the world around us. Do you know what most of our culture thinks about us? Do you know what most of our culture thinks Christians are? They think we are somewhat self-righteous people who prefer to judge other people than to love them, who who think we're better than everybody else, who are way more concerned about doctrine and do's and don'ts and compassion. They think we're too hopelessly narrow-minded to be any real good at all. That's what the world assumes about us. I have a story about that. Years ago, years ago now, I called a local high school and offered to come in several hours a week just to counsel with students that might be at risk. I'd heard that 
counselors were overwhelmed. A lot of kids have issues. I had some training in that area. I, I called up and talked to the principal. I'll, I'll come over a couple hours and we can just listen to kids talk to them. He said, well, you know, we can't let you do that because you're a pastor. Not allowed to do that because you're a pastor. It didn't make any sense to me at the time. I guess there's legal things and all that. I, I kind of got it. Well, fast forward just a few months ago. Someone from our children's ministry came and told me the most exciting thing. They said, Pastor Brian, you've got to know what happened. A local school board official approached us, our Buddy Break and Masterpiece ministry teams that serve families with children with special needs and asked us to come make a presentation to them because they could learn something from us and what we do. And I immediately remembered when I was told, no, you can't come here because you're a pastor. You see what I'm talking about? See, a lot of people have issues with the church. A lot of people have issues with pastors. Maybe rightfully so. A lot of people have issues with, with Jesus. But nobody has an issue with caring for and loving children with special needs. That's our currency to the world around us. Serving is how we make the gospel credible and visible. Last story. A few a couple months, about six weeks ago, back in April, you remember there was a terrible earthquake, actually a bunch of earthquakes in Nepal. You may barely remember that. It registered for a while in our, you know, our, our, on, the, on, the, on the news cycle, uh, and then it went away. But it was about six week, weeks ago, a terrible earthquake, killed over 8,000 people instantly, injuring many, many more, leaving whole villages destroyed. Um, well, over the last few years, we have had a ministry partner locally and globally called Children's Hunger Fund. We've done food packs for them. We've done other kinds of things with them. Um, and they have the capacity to minister globally in situations like that. So we decided as a church, quickly, in a few days, we presented you with a chance to give um, a, an emergency offering to go to Children's Hunger Fund to make a difference in that part of the world. And we were able to, within a week, send $20,000 as a church family to that effort. Just this past week, Pastor Bruce sent me an email that he had received from one of the leaders of Children's Hunger Fund on the ground in Nepal, and he sent it to our church family. Let me read it to you. It says, on behalf of the local church in Nepal, I wish to thank you for your support and prayer as we respond to the desperate needs of children and families throughout the Kathmandu Valley. Disasters like this often lead people to search for spiritual answers. We want to equip local churches so that they can capture this opportunity to proclaim the life-changing hope of the gospel. It's been nearly a month and a half since the first Nepal quake, so I wanted to give you an update on the progress of Children's Hunger Fund's response so far. Your support has enabled local churches to provide relief to the victims in the following ways. Now listen to this. 60 aluminum roof temporary shelters, 266 tents, rescue and care for 392 orphans, and food and water for 8,470 people. That was an offering we took in three days. I think that's what James meant when he said, show me your faith by your, without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. That's what Jesus meant when he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's what it means to believe with your mind, with your heart, and with your life. Believe. Memorize that verse. We'll tweet it out to you. Put it on social media. Come back next Saturday night and be able to recite that verse. Romans 10, 9. Will you make that commitment with me? Let's bow in prayer. Lord God, we thank you tonight for your word. And I thank you for this word. Believe. We see it all the time in Scripture. We use it almost without thinking about it. But it's a good word. It's a transformational word. Help us to believe with our minds, but not just with our minds. Help us to believe with our hearts, but not just with our minds and our hearts. Help us also to believe with our very lives. Use us as you seek to transform your world with your gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.